Welcome to Football Game Plans XFL Game Day here on the Game Plus Network. I'm Emery Hunt, the czar of the playbook. Wow, we're already at the week three point of the XFL season, and we have a lot to get into this week on XFL Game Day. back here on XFL Game Day. Emory Hunt, the czar of the playbook, joined now by Alex Marinoni. And Alex, week three in the XFL is getting ready to kick off tomorrow. But you look at your power rankings for week two. We saw a lot of great action in week two. Let's start with number eight on your list, Tampa Bay Vipers. Talk to me about the Vipers and why they ended up last on your list. Well, first of all, they're 0-2. And honestly, in those two losses, they look like they've had the biggest holes on both sides of the ball, especially on the quarterback side. They don't look like they have a set game plan on the offense, which is why I feel like they're behind in development with then the rest of the league. And uh, defensively, they've been able to stay in games for the most part, but they just aren't dominant enough to keep themselves uh, in these games that is lacking the quarterback position. Yeah, you talk about a team that has the opportunity to play a Quentin Flowers who seems to move the football every time he's in the game, they at least get to the red zone. So you know 20 to 20, he's pretty solid. They probably should use him inside the red zone more so than they do in between the red zone. So they have to, they'll have to figure out their quarterback situation because they're going home this week uh, to play their first home game. And that crowd, pro Tampa crowd, pro South Florida crowd, yeah. They've seen, they've seen Quentin Flowers play a lot. They probably want him to play his best football in front of the home fans. So let's see if they make that switch. But you look at the, the rest of your top eight, uh, the New York Guardians are number seven. Now we've been to the game here. We were at their first game, their home opener. They got a victory against those Tampa Bay Vipers. But let's talk about number seven on your list, New York. Yeah, New York had the biggest drop. They were number two last week. They dropped five spots here because they just haven't been a consistent team on the offensive side of the ball. Their defense, I thought, has been one of the better ones in the league. I mean, you look at what they were able to do against the defenders, despite being on the field so much, the turnovers from Matt McGloin in that offense, there was three total in that first half. Uh, they kept the score at 12-0. They kept it very close. And in that game with the Vipers, they didn't hold, they held the Vipers to zero points up until the end where they kicked the field goal. So the Guardians, I thought, defensively are there. They have the skill set offensively. They're just not putting it all together. And I believe it starts with the quarterback and all the trouble and turmoil looks like they have behind closed doors that Matt McGloin alluded to on the broadcast. Yeah, you look at a team that has Mikael McKay, who seems to catch every deep ball thrown his way. You also have a very competent run game. Your offensive line has done exceptionally well. Now, yeah, DC blitzed them a lot last week, mm -hmm. took advantage of that. They took advantage of Matt McGloin. Maybe it's time to go to Marquise Williams, a guy that played well at UNC, looks to move the football a little bit better than McGloin did, at least in the passing game throughout the short time he was in the ball game. Let's see what he can do the whole week of work and get back out there and see if they can get these guys back on the winning track. You look at team number six, the Seattle Dragons. Now they were able to get their win at home in front of 30,000 fans last weekend against Tampa. Basically like everybody's beating Tampa Bay right <laughs> now, but what is it about the, the Dragons that you like? What I like about the Dragons is that they, at least at home, they really took into that home crowd and the defense really stepped up. And we know we just mentioned the Vipers struggles on the offensive side of the ball, but a lot of that is because of good defensive play. And the Dragons defense really stepped up. Their secondary, I mean, it's starting to look like the Legion of Boom over there a little bit, but uh, they do have struggles at the quarterback position like the other two teams below them and offensively altogether, putting it a full game together. But defensively, they've been able to step up and it, call, and it uh, gave them a win last week. Yeah, look at number five, the LA Wildcats, a team that got back on the winning track or at least looked to Bart to try to get back on the winning track. They got stabilized last week against Dallas, even though they lost the game. It was a much better game uh, than what they showed in week one. What were your thoughts on LA? I thought so too. I think part of the problem was, again, I mean, we could do it for every team, but with the quarterback position, I thought Charles can off week one, looked like he was starting to get into a rhythm a little bit in that game, but you could tell being the backup quarterback that he w didn't get the reps that maybe Josh Johnson got all camp and struggled a little bit. Then Josh Johnson gets put back in his first debut and he moves the ball and does a nice job offensively, but wasn't able to put the ball in the end zone until late in the fourth quarter. Uh, defensively, I thought they gave the Renegades a run for their money and that was back-to-back -back decent weeks from the LA Wildcats, but 
it just wasn't enough, and that's why I have them there. They're, they look like a team that, when the quarterback and the offensive position, or the offense in t general, get going, this could be a team that can start putting up points and making a noise in this league. Yeah, they, they got turnovers. They turned mm -hmm. the ball over twice, I believe. They should have mm -hmm. picked one off earlier in the contest. They should have had three, three yep. interceptions. So the offense, you saw the, the continuity, the, the inconsistency with Josh Johnson mm -hmm. missed those two deep balls. That probably is going to get better as yeah. they get more acclimated with him back there in the pocket. Number four, the Dallas Renegades, outstanding team you have there. What is it about the Renegades? I thought on paper they looked like one of the more complete teams to start the year, and they put up a good performance with their, with uh, Philip Nelson week one. And then when Landry Jones came in, it looked like there's just a different feel. There's a, they feel like their leader is back. He made some questionable decisions. Should have thrown the ball. Should have thrown three interceptions in that game but was able to move the ball down the field, was constantly, I think they put up over 400 yards of offense in that game, and then in the fourth quarter, they start to explode. And then they have uh, guys like Cameron Artis, uh, Art Artis Payne in the backfield that were able to take over that game late in the game and uh, help out Landry Jones in that offense and put it together with that defense. They are definitely a top four team. Yeah, you look at three, two, and one, you have the Battle Hawks at three, defenders at number two, but let's talk about the Roughnecks before we get out of here, hit a break. Why Houston number one? I think they're the most complete team. I mean, you look at it from the defensive side of the ball. They, at all three levels, can play and stop anybody, specifically up front with Coney Ely and company. That is a very dominant defensive front that got after Jordan Tiamo last week and week one were all over the quarterback. And then offensively, they got the best quarterback in the league right now and weapons all around. And that's not even including Sammy Coates, who struggled early on, who if he starts to get going, that's only going to make this offense more dynamic. His first catch will be his first, his, the next catch will be his first catch. <laughs> That's a guy that has to start catching the football. Yeah. So, good job here with Alex's Power Rankings. We'll take a quick commercial break and be back with more XFL Game Day here on the Game Plus Network. Uh, man, you know, it's, it's that old thing, you know, perseverance, consistency, hard work, you know what I mean? Uh, my goal is to put the same work into, you know, my businesses, my family that I put into football, you know, and, and I've been running with that mantra since, you know, since I got married back in 97, you know, that if I'm going to have a successful marriage, I got to, you know, the same hard work and same cons consistency and discipline I had in the football field, I got to put it in my marriage and with my kids and with my, with my businesses and all that, so. Uh, it teaches you a lot, man. You know how to deal with your fellow man and not look at his, his color, but look at you know what he can do for the overall good of what you're trying to accomplish. You know, so uh, it, you know, sports to me in general is just an incredible deal. When you, when you talk about football specifically, because of the closeness of guys, I, I just believe it's an amazing sport. Football game plan is brought to you in part by. Ninth and Lux. Visit the website ninthandlux.com and check out the clothing gallery. Do you music with featured artist IW and his latest album, Season 2? You can check that out on iTunes as well as doyoumusic.com. Nesby Phipps, art, life, entertainment. Nesbyphipps.com. Grind It Out Fitness. Visit the website grinditoutfitness.com and download the app. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Scott Schertzen, and I'm going to give you Viper fans out there a little bit of hope going into week three. Looking statistically at a lot of the numbers that are out there, if you, if you look at it, in each of their first two games this season, I'm giving you guys some hope here, they had more plays than the opponent, more first downs than their opponent, more rushing yards, more passing yards, and straight up owned it on third down, converting 50% of their third downs, while their defense only gave up 15% of third downs, which is huge. They are 0-2, everybody knows that. A lot of, a lot of people out there have them uh, posted at number eight in the league right now, and at the bottom. The biggest reason for that, the turnovers. This has been a major issue, giving up three turnovers in each of the first two games. Now, looking back in the NFL the last 15 years, a team that goes negative two in a game on turnovers wins 18% of the time. A team that goes negative three on turnovers wins only 9% of the time. Mark Trussman has got to be able to figure out a way to keep the ball out of the opponent's hands when he's on offense. Right now, the defense has been really, really solid in both games here. The offense is making things happen. They are getting the running plays. They actually are ahead on both on time of possession in both of those games. So they have the potential to really turn the season around. 
Now, going into this week, they are playing against the 2-0 Roughneck team and a phenomenal P.J. Walker, who right now, the way he's playing, will not be in the XFL next year. He's going to be back in the NFL. He's at seven touchdowns, so this is going to be a fascinating competition here between that defense and what P.J. Walker is able to bring. I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. They're playing in a home crowd. I think, personally, Tampa is going to win this. This might get me a lot of flack from the Houston fans, and it's going to give me a lot of flack if I end up being wrong. But I'm going to give them a shot, and I'm going to say that they are going to come out of this in a must-win game, one and two. We'll see what happens on Sunday. I'm going to be really curious to see what happens this weekend. For, for football game plan, I'm Scott Churchson. Stay awesome. Let's kick off our preview down there in Tampa as they play host to the Houston Roughnecks, the number one team in the XFL, according to many people out there, including our own Alex Marinoni's power rankings. But when you look at this matchup, starting with Houston in this ball game, it's about playing better defense. Their defense has quietly given up a lot of yards and a lot of points in their two ball games. Now, granted, they have the offense to supersede that so they can score points. Thus, their defense will be on the field a little bit longer than others would be on the field because their offense scores not only a lot, but they score pretty quickly. So when you look at a, a defensive matchup here, it's all about stopping a run. You want to make, whether it's Aaron Murray or Taylor Cornelius, you want to make those guys beat you throwing the football. If they can stop the run and make this an Aaron Murray or Taylor Cornelius versus Phillip Walker ball game, that's a game that Houston can easily win. When you look at Tampa on, in this matchup, Tampa's offense has to find that balance. When they have Quentin Flowers in the ball game, they are able to run the football very well. They take him out inside the red zone. That's when you want to utilize his skill set the most because he has, again, the ability to make it an 11 on 11 game. But if they don't play Flowers at starting quarterback and go with Cornelius or Aaron Murray, it's about finding that balance. So you want to find easy throws easy completions to help get those guys into a groove early they have the ability to move the football down the field we've seen this the first two games they get a ton of yards but once they get inside the red zone they can't punch it in for touchdowns so that's going to have to change but it's all about getting those guys into an early groove if they want to have success but when all said and done you look at a team that's playing hot right now the houston roughnecks i think they go into tampa get a big victory and move on to 3-0 on the season. And we'll see if this is the type of game, the type of victory for the Houston Roughnecks that forces a change in Tampa Bay at the quarterback position and go with Quentin Flowers as their full-time starter. Troy Anthony here with XFL Game Day, bringing you your best bets for week three. Right now, there's about three teams in the league that are truly juggernauts. The Houston Roughnecks, the DC Defenders, and the St. Louis Battlehawks. They all coincidentally have the three best quarterbacks in the league right now. Upcoming this Saturday, the Houston Roughnecks take on the Tampa Bay Vipers. In this one, I like the line of minus six for Houston. They have been damn near unstoppable to this point. So I'm gonna take them with the spread in this one, even though they're on the road. In the first Sunday matchup, I like the Battlehawks, minus 435, money line, at home against the Guardians. The Guardians have a solid defense, but their offense has been struggling to the max. If you look at Matt McGloin's comments during their previous game against the DC Defenders, they really have questions along the offensive side of the ball. And with the Battlehawks led by Tayamu, he's going to be putting up a lot of yards in this one. And in the final matchup on Sunday, we have the DC Defenders heading to take on the Los Angeles Wildcats. The Defenders, arguably one of the best teams in the league, if not the best team in the league as well. Cardell Jones has been balling out. And even though they're on the road, I'm taking them at minus 360 money line as well. I think they pull out this W easily. For XFL Game Day's best bets, I'm Troy Anthony. Let's move out to the Pacific Northwest where the Dallas Renegades travel to take on the Seattle Dragons who will be hosting their second consecutive home game out there at CenturyLink Field. Should be a raucous crowd. But looking at this game on paper, Landry Jones and that Renegades offense will have to have an encore performance of what we saw in the latter part of their game against Los Angeles. We saw Cameron Artis Payne have a great day running the football. We saw Landry Jones finally get into a groove and start to connect on some passes deep down the field. He has to protect the football. We talked about that earlier in this broadcast and also on our XFL Game Day podcast. He threw two terrible interceptions, should have, should have thrown three, but 
cleaning up the turnovers, helped him out in the fourth quarter. They got points, they got the win in his first start since returning from that knee injury. So if all things are considered, if you're looking at this from a positive standpoint, which we are, then Landry Jones and his offense should have a repeat performance hitting the ground running against Seattle. But this is a step up in weight class, so to speak, defensively. The Dragons do a great job of not only swarming to the football, but they take the ball away. These are guys that are aggressive at all three levels. Their defensive line does a great job versus the run. Their linebackers are very speedy and athletic and can do a great job of taking away passing windows. And on the back end, they have the secondary to take the ball away. So defensively, if they can slow down their passing game, I think they have a great chance. Now on the offensive side, Brandon Silvers is another quarterback that saw his success increase as the game went on. He started to get a little bit more comfortable. Fans out there were calling for B.J. Daniels, the backup quarterback, but there's still some issues offensively in the passing game. And if they hit the ground slow against this Renegades offense, which seems to have caught fire in their passing game, then Seattle could find themselves on the losing end of the stick. I think this will be a back and forth affair. I think both defenses will come ready to play. I do like the continuity and the consistency of Dallas. I look for the Renegades to go on the road and get a win against the Dragons. Well, the game of football has taught me so many, so many things, man. Now, think about, think about the huddle we have right now. Right? I tell people this all the time. There's a reason why they call it a huddle. You know, he, people have been huddling all their lives, trying to find ways to enhance each other's lives. The great teams, the great teams do that all the time. The great teams do that. The better the, the better the huddle, the better the team. And so it, it, it's simple, man, how if you huddle for all the right reasons, we wouldn't have Ferguson. We wouldn't have some of the challenges that we have in our society. But as we all know, there's always a moment where somebody doesn't belong in the huddle. And yet we have to continue to move on. we got to continue to play. So the game of life, man, is always surrounded, starting with the hub. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm lucky enough to know that, you know, by the graces of God, man, it's, it's been a it's been a nice huddle. It's been a nice huddle. And if I just keep making sure that he's in front of me, I'm gonna be all right. Be sure to order your copy of the Go-Go Offense by Coach Brennan Marion on footballgameplan.com slash go-go offense. Coach Marion goes through the ins and outs of his explosive offense, one that's tearing up the college football field and putting a lot of points on the scoreboard. Again, you can order your copy at footballgameplan.com slash go-go offense. Football Game Plan is brought to you in part by Financial Coaching LLC, Investment, Retirement, Security, Stewardship Credit, Financial growth is in your hands. StewardshipCredit.com. Adrian Marie Photo, photographer, writer, management. Adrian Marie Photography.com. Lock Multimedia. Welcome back to Football Game Plans XFL Game Day, and we'll jump into our Sunday slate of game previews, and we'll start in St. Louis where they play host to the New York Guardians. Now, New York will have to have their answers at the quarterback position. Let's say they go back into this ball game or they go into this ball game with Matt McGloin starting at QB. What he has to do to get into an early groove is find his tight end, Jake Powell, who started the game really well against Tampa Bay in week one and started the game really well, in my opinion, in week two against DC. He's the best tight end, I believe, in this game. And in this league, they have to find ways to get him going early to not only get the offense jump started, but to also get Matt McGloin into a groove because quite as kept, their offensive line can definitely move guys off the spot. They have a solid run game. It's about getting McGloin in an early groove. Finding your tight end early could help him do that. That way, later on in the game, they can go to the outside and hit those big plays deep down the field to Mikel McKay and Joe Horn and company like that. On the defensive side, when you're playing a team like St. Louis, it's about stopping the run first. You have a guy in Jordan Tiamu, the quarterback that makes it an 11-on-11 game. If that defense is not predicated to stopping the run first, 
they could struggle in this contest. Then you worry about everything else. Now for St. Louis in this contest, you look at what they do well. They play efficient football. They're playing the same game that the DC defenders are playing, except they have a much better run game. So Jordan Tiamu is doing a great job of moving the offense down the field. He's putting points up on the board. He's doing a great job both with his legs and with his arm. And you look at how he's protecting the football, that's going to be key in this game because we know New York's defense does a great job in taking the ball away. So playing your game is one key to victory for St. Louis, that efficient offense that we like to see. They had their chances to knock off Houston. I think they can do a great job of having success on offense against the Guardians. Defensively, it's about frustrating Matt McGloin back there in the pocket. The best way to do that, apply pressure. We saw them do that against Phillip Walker. He was just able to get out of the way because he's an athlete. McGloin is not that lucky, not that fortunate. There is an opportunity to get him to force some bad passes to where your defense, which has played best all season long, can force some turnover. So with them having the better offense, the much more consistent offense, the much more consistent pressure style defense, I like St. Louis to win this ball game and win big to open up their home slate there in front of their fans that have been dying for football. I like the Battle Hawks to knock out the Guardians at home. I'm Alex Marinoni for XFL Game Day. Now, through two weeks of this young XFL season, and many of the skeptics are starting to come out. Before the season started, the doubters claimed that the interest in a spring league will ultimately not be there. The northern teams like New York, D.C., and Seattle will struggle to get fans to the games due to the cold weather, and places like Los Angeles, Tampa Bay, and St. Louis can barely generate a viewership for their NFL teams and ex-NFL teams. So why would it work for a spring league? With the week one numbers in the books, the XFL did very well, averaging 3.12 million viewers between the first four games. Many of the doubters were shocked, but claimed this was the case because it was the opening weekend, and of course the numbers are going to be higher. Something to note here though, on the same day the Expo opened up their season was the same day that Duke and UNC met for the first time on the basketball court this year. One of the most watched games every year among regular, se regular season sporting events saw its second lowest viewership rating ever. That's not coincidence. If the attendance numbers have any correlation to the TV ratings, then the experts are going to be shocked again. When it comes to the attendance from week two, the XFL, unlike spring leagues of the past, actually saw an increase in total attendance from week one. In 1983, the USFL saw an attendance dip of 10.7% of fans. In 2001, the first XFL saw a dip in attendance by 8.5. Last year, however, the AAF actually saw an increase by just 2%, but the XFL this year saw an increase of over 9%. Seeing an increase in 2019 and 20 shows that there is interest in today's world for spring football especially considering that over 50% of the players in the XFL have come from the AAF. The people of Seattle carried a large chunk of this number with a turnout of 29,172 in attendance. This is a city that has arguably the most talented quarterback in the NFL in Russell Wilson and about eight years of being a consistent contender. It's the middle of February and this many people showed up to watch Brandon Silvers take snaps? Something tells me the XFL is doing something right. In St. Louis, they are not taking football for granted as last week, something happened in the city that was quite hard to believe. On Sunday, both the Battlehawks and the Blues had games on the road at the exact same time. Within the city, the Battlehawks game received a rating of 6.0, whereas the Blues received a 3.1 rating. They doubled the reigning, defending, undisputed Stanley Cup champions in their own city in TV ratings, and with their first home game coming up this weekend against the Guardians, ticket sales are expected to be north of 30,000. And we'll wrap up this week's edition of XFL Game Day with a preview between the DC Defenders and the Los Angeles Wildcats. DC has the best offense, arguably the best quarterback in the game. They come in firing on all cylinders. Now their run game started to catch fire a little bit last week against the Guardians. We'll see if that is the case against Los Angeles, whose offense will look a lot better in week three with the second start of Josh Johnson. So we should see a much more cohesive offense. Defensively, they took the ball away against Dallas. I don't think they'll have as much luck against Cardell Jones. I do like the defenders to keep this one rolling and move on to 3-0.